So we're talking about the British Gold Sovereign, uh, one of the most important coins in the world with a really long and distinguished history that very much mirrors our island nation, as I hope to show you. Uh, and uh, I've been interested in the, the sovereign now for a couple of years. I found some absolutely wonderful sort of information about it, which is really, really exciting. And I want to try and share that with you as best I can today. So we'll, we'll start off by really just looking at the coins that, that were around before the sovereign made its first appearance. Uh, the Celtic coins, gold coins, um, as I said, they're absolutely beautiful, some fantastic images on those, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, lovely sort of abstract horses, faces and, and plants. When the Romans arrived, they brought their own coins with them. And when they left about 400 years later, obviously Britain went back largely to bartering. And it wasn't until 1344, during the reign of King Edward III, that gold coins really appeared in our currency. And you have the double leopard, the, the double florin there, which had a value of six shillings and depicted the monarch enthroned with a leopard on either side of the throne. Uh, that didn't last very long. That lasted about a year and it was replaced with the gold noble. Uh, worth six shillings and eightpence, which depicted the king standing on a boat uh, with a flag at its helm, brandishing a sword and a shield. Um, and then when King Edward the, uh, the Fourth arrived, he basically introduced uh, a new type of coin, an angel, uh, worth uh, eight shillings. Uh, and that depicted the Archangel Michael and Satan as a dragon. Um, it was tremendously popular as a coin. It became a, a very much used as a touch piece. Uh, believed to have the power of healing and protection. And of course, it's also significant because it marked the first appearance of a dragon on, on a British gold coin, uh, and it wasn't going to be the last one either. Um, so then fast forward then to 1485, uh, Richard III met his match uh, at the Battle of Bosworth, um, obviously became the last English king to die in battle. And, uh, and the new king, uh, Henry VII, uh, on the 28th of October, 1489, it instructed his mint to produce, quote, a new money of gold. And they responded in kind and struck for him the largest gold coin that has ever been seen, had ever been struck in England. Um, as I say, worth 15.5 grams, 42 millimeters in diameter, twice as heavy as the gold royale, worth 20 shillings. Uh, it was originally going to be called the double royale, but the king insisted that it be called the sovereign, and the name stuck. So uh, the Tudor monarchs wanted a majestic symbol to showcase their power and wealth. It's unlikely that a coin of this size uh, and value would have actually gone into daily circulation, but it was a show of strength to cement his position as king. Uh, the Latin inscription uh, around it is, uh, and I'll translate it, Henry, by the grace of God, King of England and France, Lord of Ireland. It's, uh, it was very much seen as, as an opportunity for the monarch to stamp his authority and, uh, and make everybody know that he was the king. Um, now, all the Tudor monarchs um, who came after him struck the sovereign uh, themselves. Um, they debased it several times. Henry VIII debased his on, on a few occasions, reducing the, the gold value uh, in order to pay off and fund his, his various different wars. Um, and Henry VIII also is important because he also introduced uh, a new design on the smaller gold noble, and it was St. George and the Dragon. And obviously we're going to see that again uh, coming up shortly. Um, so in 1603, uh, Elizabeth I died, the last Tudor monarch, and James VI, King of Scotland, became King of England, James I. And he struck a 20 shilling sovereign in the first year of his reign. But then he renamed it. Uh, he renamed a, a, and created a coin called the Unite because he wanted to celebrate the uniting of his kingdoms. And there's some speculation as to why he didn't particularly like the name Sovereign. It might be simply that he considered it to be a Tudor name that they had given the, the Tudor coins or, or the Tudor monarchs creating it. And of course, Elizabeth I, the last Tudor monarch, um, was, uh, was responsible for uh, signing the death warrant of his mother, uh, Mary, Ju Mary, Queen of Scots. So I I'm sure there probably wasn't a huge amount of love lost there. So he renamed the coin and no sovereign would be struck again for another 213 years. So the sovereign is gone. Meanwhile, of course, we have two centuries uh, as, as the authority of his successors to rule by divine right were tested through gunpowder plot and civil war and regicide and reg restoration. 
and eventually uh, you have the the beginning then of a uh, of a new uh, great recoinage and the great recoinage came about uh, as a consequence of the industrial revolution uh, which obviously brought considerable changes transformed cities um, people were moving obviously from rural areas into uh, into the cities rural britain had been largely self-sufficient but as people moved into cities they needed to be paid so the coinage at that time was extremely badly worn it was barely legible it was underweight it was often fake uh, counterfeiters could take a genuine coin and make two or three underweight ones from the same metal uh, there was also a massive increase in population so all of this conspired to really create a really diff diff difficult position for the coinage to be in in 1815 the duke of wellington won a victory over napoleon at waterloo and Britain then needed to restabilize and stabilize the currency. And the master of the mint, who was tasked with restoring confidence in the nation's money, was a gentleman by the name of William Wellesley Pole. And William Wellesley Pole um, is, is perhaps uh, least well known for being the Duke of Wellington's older brother. Uh, they were actually related. So while, while the Duke of Wellington was in Paris um, redrawing the map of Europe, uh, Wellesley Pole was sitting in London uh, working out how to solve the problem of the nation's currency. And uh, what they did was he took the silver and the gold coins, he withdrew them all from circulation, he melted them down, and he replaced them with new coins struck at the new purpose-built facility at Tower Hill in London. So the move from the Tower of London, they, they, they moved over uh, centuries there, um, but they took advantage of the new cutting-edge steam presses, which allowed the coins to be struck with much greater accuracy and precision than had been, ever been known before. And in 1816, the government made a decision to scrap what was then the gold guinea, uh, valued at, at 21 shillings. That hadn't been struck since 1799, except for a special batch in 1813 to help Wellington's campaign. Um, but they decided to replace it with a new gold, gold coin worth 20 shillings. And of course, it had a name from the past. It was to be called the Sovereign. It was going to be half the size of the original Tudor Sovereign, so at 22.05 millimetres and 7.98 grams, and 22 carat in, uh, in gold, that's 91.6% gold. And those specifications haven't changed. They're, they're still struck in exactly the same way today. So Wellesley Pole was very keen to make sure that the new coins should be aesthetically pleasing as well as technically perfect. Um, and for this reason, he was very eager to employ the finest engravers who would transform coins into miniature works of art. And uh, they were tremendously necessary. It was a very, very important time. Uh, the coins were, were, were enormously required. There's a lovely cartoon there. You can see there showing the new coinage, showing Wellesley Pole shoveling handfuls of uh, shoveling shovelsfuls of, uh, of coins to a, gr a grateful nation waiting eagerly to, to receive them. But, um, but obviously he wanted to get, uh, the design was also important to him. He wanted to employ the best, the best possible engravers and craftsmen to really turn these coins into, into miniature works of art. And no story of the British gold sovereign can be told without reference to the brilliant sculptor and engraver who Wellesley Pole found uh, to do his design. Um, a gentleman by the name of Benedetto Pistrucci he was born in Rome in 1783 and had an incredible uh, life. I mean, I mean uh, an astonishing upbringing. Um, his family had to flee Napoleon uh, when he was 17 because his father was a high court judge. And, uh, and the, when he heard that the, the soldiers were looking for him to arrest him, um, that the father had to escape dressed as a soldier. Uh, he wanted his son to become a lawyer, but, uh, but Pastrucci hated his lessons. Uh, and when he was sent away to study, uh, he was beaten so severely by his schoolmasters for neglecting his studies that his father actually feared for his own safety and so brought him home and let him do what he wanted to do, which was to become an apprentice for a cameo cutter. And he was quickly uh, acquired a, a formidable reputation uh, as a cameo cutter. And for a time, he worked for Napoleon's uh, sister, Elisa, in her royal palace. And he also made the very last known portrait of Napoleon in 1815 as he was waiting to be exiled to St. Helena. 
after the, the Napoleonic Wars had finished, after the Battle of Waterloo, um, a few months afterwards, uh, Pastrucci was able to get passage to London. And, um, and right away, he, he managed to find himself, through no fault of his own, embroiled in a minor scandal. But it was the making of him, uh, because it meant that his reputation uh, went before him. Uh, he was introduced to an MP called Richard Payne Knight, who was a wealthy scholar, an author, and also a coin collector. And Pastrucci describes him in his memoirs as, as a great connoisseur in gems, cameos, bronzes, statues, medals, and antique vases. And Payne Knight was very keen to show Pastrucci his cabinet full of precious things. He had a, a collection uh, of artifacts that he was enormously proud of and which just wanted every opportunity to show them off. And he wanted to show Pastrucci his latest acquisition, which he said was the, the finest Greek cameo in existence. And uh, I've got a picture of it here to show you. Um, and Pastrucci declared, uh, much to Payne Knight's shock and horror, that it was actually his work. Uh, it wasn't actually an ancient Greek cameo at all. It was something that he created just six years previously. And it turned out that his former business partner had been passing them off as ancient Greek originals to, uh, to English customers. It wasn't Pastucci's fault. Um, and Pastucci was horrified when he heard it. Payne Knight refused to believe that Pastucci could have actually created such a beautiful uh, cameo. And in order to demonstrate his mastery of the craft, uh, Pastrucci went off and did a better one for him in just a few days. Uh, and of course, the, the scandal, as it was, uh, made his reputation because um, the people flocked to see him and to see the work. And it soon led to, to some nice lucrative commissions. And one of them was from Sir Joseph Banks, president of the Royal Society. And he, he commissioned Pastrucci to design a cameo of King George III cut in red jasper in return for a fee of 50 guineas. And it was to prove a fateful commission uh, because when Sir Joseph later showed his friend Wellesley Pole uh, the, the cameo cut in red jasper, uh, he knew that he'd found the man he was looking for to design the coinage. And in June of 1816, Wellesley Pole wrote to his bosses at the Treasury and he said, I have thought it desirable to employ Mr. Pastrucci an artist of the greatest celebrity and whose works place him above all competition as a gem engraver to make models for the dyes of the new coinage. And I request your Lordship's authority to pay Mr. Petrucci such remuneration as may be deemed necessary for his works. So only a British subject could actually hold the position of chief engraver. And so Petrucci was so, and so Wellesley Pole was able to give him the work uh, and the salary, but not the title. Uh, when the position fell vacant in 1817. And, uh, and people, I have to say, were, were really, really upset and angry. Uh, British coin artists and engravers really resented the fact that a foreigner had actually received such a prestigious commission as to design the coins of the land. And many people felt that his cousin, William Wyan, um, the, the cousin, sorry, of Thomas Wyan, who had just died, the old chief engraver, uh, who was a talented engraver himself, uh, should have been given the job. But when Wellesley Pole asked Pastrucci for a majestic reverse, he suggested St. George. Uh, he'd recently completed a commission in the Greek style for one Lord and Lady Spencer, and he loved the Greek style. Uh, he studied the Elgin marbles, and he was really determined to create uh, a St. George in the Greek style and, and recommended it for the, the reverse of the sovereign. Uh, it is said famously that Pastrucci asked an Italian waiter at Brunette's Hotel in Leicester Square, where he was lodging to actually model for him in order to create the St. George. And there has been some speculation as to what inspired Pastrucci's composition of this coin. Uh, it is different from any other depictions that we've seen of St. George and the Dragon before. Uh, they both had appeared on gold coins, of course, before, but it's possible as well that Pastrucci may have been inspired by ancient coins. Uh, both the, Greek, the ancient Greeks and the Romans had depicted a warrior on horseback spearing a fallen enemy as it cowers under the hooves of his horse. And of course, it is possible that Pastrucci would have seen these, and that might have been his inspiration for them. So in ancient Greece, uh, you can see, I've just put up on the screen there on the left, 
um, a, a lovely image there of, of a horseman uh, spearing a barbarian and the horse again is rearing up on two two legs and the uh, the, the enemy is is falling under the hooves uh, this is the king of peonia uh, petros in 335 circa bc um, notice as well um, the ground beneath their feet uh, appears as a historic as a horizontal line that's also uh, quite significant. On the right there, you can actually see my own coin, which is a coin of the Emperor Magnentius, um, 350 AD, and it's called the Glory of Rome. I'm holding it up. You will not be able to see it. It's far too small, but you can see it, obviously. I've made a, an image of it there on the screen. Um, and that depicts, again, on its reverse, a helmeted rider on horseback trampling a barbarian underfoot. And so what you're seeing here is, uh, and if, you put up, if I put up the... Um, the actual um, pastrucci's to you can see there's some striking similarities um, you can see a helmet on the rider with with striking plumage a long cloak billowing out behind him you can see a cloak fastened to the rider with fabric across the chest a weapon in his right hand his arm is flexed his horse is wearing a bridle it's rearing up on two legs the vanquished adversary is falling back under the hooves looking up at the victor and again the ground is a horizontal line and you might also be able to spot a broken spear as well sticking out of the ground it's another little tiny detail there but it, it's there on both coins now there's no evidence that pastrucci saw this coin but i, I think it's a strong possibility uh, particularly as the magnentius coin is almost exactly the same size as the modern sovereign so in 1817 pastrucci depicted george iii in the neoclassical style, middle-aged with a laurel wreath in his short hair and a striking focused gaze. In reality, um, Pastucci didn't meet George III. Uh, he couldn't model him from life. The king was elderly and bald with a long white beard. Uh, so it couldn't be more different from the image that, uh, that Pastucci created. With the first sovereign, they struck about three million of them in 1817, but surviving examples obviously are pretty rare today. And even rarer than that, uh, than that one is the 1819 sovereign. Uh, there were only 37,000 of those were struck, uh, and one of those actually sold for 186,000 in 2013. So if you find an 1819 sovereign, hang on to it. It's worth a fortune. Um, as the United Kingdom championed the Industrial Revolution, this new modern sovereign coin struck with accuracy and precision championed uh, our manufacturing expertise on the world stage. Obviously, in 1820, uh, the old king died, and the new king, George IV, uh, became king. He'd been serving as the Prince Regent, um, and, uh, and he now became, uh, obviously, became the new king. Um, Pastrucci took the opportunity to revise his design. As you can see, I've got the 1817 next to the one that he created in 1821. Um, and basically, they, they removed the, the French inscription and the garter that ran around the edge of the, uh, the coin. Uh, and they uh, and Pastrucci took the opportunity to make his uh, St. George larger. Uh, and he took a few, uh, uh, he made a few little changes. The one the most noticeable, uh, you can see he took the, the broken spear that George was carrying and he turned it into a sword. Now, that was all well and good for the reverse and everybody was happy with that. But they were less of a, the, the new king was less happy uh, with his portrait that Pastrucci had created of him. Um, now, Pastrucci depicted him very much in the neoclassical style as rather an overweight Nero with laurel leaves in his hair. Uh, and this was not how the king wanted to be depicted. Uh, despite being, as you can see, quite overweight himself, he, uh, he, he fancied himself as being a far more debonair man about town. And so gave um, a, a sculpture uh, that he had had made, a very flattering one, by Sir, Char Sir Francis Chantry. And he basically brought that to the Mint and he said to the Mint designers, I want you to model, you know, forget about you know, modeling me, I want you to model this. This is, this is the image that I want on the coins. And Pastrucci was absolutely outraged because he refused point blank to copy the work of another artist. He said that to do so would violate his artistic integrity. And so the king very helpfully sent along a painting from another artist by Sir Thomas Lawrence. And, uh, and Pastrucci was ordered by the Royal Mint to hang it up on his studio wall. So it would always be looking down at him and it would hopefully inspire him to create a new portrait. 
Uh, Pastucci honoured, had no choice, he, obviously he had to honour, he had to put it up on the wall, but he turned the painting to face the wall. He refused to even look at it. And, and eventually, Wellesley Pole realised that he wasn't getting anywhere at all with, uh, with his temperamental Italian, uh, and so persuaded um, Pastucci's French assistant, a Frenchman called Jean-Baptiste Merlin, to create the portrait for the new 1823 double sovereign, which he modelled on the Chantry bust. And this is what Merlin came up with, um, and this appeared uh, on the 1823 double sovereign. It's quite significant um, because it's the only appearance of this particular design. Uh, it only appeared on that one coin in that one year. So, uh, so it is quite uh, it is quite interesting. Uh, unfortunately for Pastrucci, um, his friend and mentor then stepped down uh, as master of the mint, and the new master of the mint, Baron Thomas Wallace, was far less inclined to tolerate the artist's temperamental stubbornness. And in a very terse letter to his superiors, he reported that the conduct of Mr. Pastrucci in refusing to exercise the order of the master in fulfilment of the king's command render him no longer of use to the mint as chief engraver, whose peculiar duty it is to prepare the head dies for the coin. Now, obviously, we know Pastrucci wasn't actually the chief engraver. He wasn't allowed to occupy that position, but he was doing the work of the chief engraver. And so the task of creating a new coin portrait uh, went to an Englishman. And uh, second engraver, William Wyan, uh, then stepped up and, uh, and he was given the task. And so Wyan created the portrait then that appeared on all of the coinage, including obviously the sovereign. Uh, now, Wyan also modelled his design on the Chantry bust, which is why the two designs look quite similar. Um, but it was the first time that a British monarch had appeared on a circulating coin without a laurel wreath or a crown. Uh, and that really appealed to the king's debonair style and reputation as a trendsetter. Now, Wyan was made the chief engraver in 1828, and Pastrucci was appointed the chief medalist so that he could finish a commission that he had begun uh, in 1819. Uh, it was a commission for the Waterloo Medal. Uh, and knowing that he would be fired as soon as it was complete, Pastrucci didn't actually finish it until 1849, when he was about to retire. Um, so when George IV died uh, in 1830 without a legitimate child to succeed him, uh, his younger brother became King William IV. At age 64, he was the oldest person in British history ever to be crowned. And once again, Wine was asked to base his coin design on a flattering bust created by Sir Francis Chantry, who personally supervised the creation of the coin portrait. The kings weren't taking any chances. King was very pleased with the result. Uh, Merlin was put to work on the, on the reverse, and he created this beautiful heraldic shield, uh, very much considered the heraldic high point of British coin design. Uh, now, William IV is the only British monarch like, since George III never to have a sovereign struck with Pastrucci's George and the Dragon on it. But for the double sovereign issued uh, as a proof for the coronation, um, Merlin had a little bit of room to play with. And so what he did was he did this. He um, created a, a beautiful mantle, which he put around the heraldic shield. And if you look at the bottom, you can actually see dangling from it is a chain with a little St. George and the Dragon on it. So he managed to get St. George and the Dragon in there uh, for him, even though his boss, Pastrucci, was no longer submitting coin designs and was no longer having coins uh, with his designs on them. So in 1837, the crown passed to William's 18-year-old niece, Alexandrina Victoria. And unlike her uncles, she actually was quite happy to have her portrait actually uh, sculpted. And so she invited both Wine and Pasucci to Windsor Castle to model her from life. Now, the two men didn't get on at all. They, was a, they were deadly rivals. And so she arranged to have separate sittings with them. But apparently it is said that they travelled down to Windsor together. So that would be a fascinating thing to see. Uh, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to see that. Um, Wyan's design was, was very highly praised and was to remain on gold and silver coins for an astonishing 49 years. Uh, it was also used as the model for the postage stamp as well. Uh, Pastrucci's design for the Coronation Medal, on the other hand, was very widely criticised. Uh, that was, I'm just put the two side by side to show you, they were both uh, basically modelled on the same day by, by, the, by the same queen, and you can see they're very different portraits. 
Um, the coronation model, I think, has a, a charm all of its own, but Pastrucci was uh, a bit of a pariah by this time because he had uh, he had refused to do the king's uh, commissions and coin commissions. Uh, everybody gave him a bit of a wide berth, and as a result, people were very dismissive of his designs, which I think is a great shame, but, uh, but there we are. Um, Merlin's Reverse, on the other hand, um, actually had a, uh, again, um, he actually created a few very interesting things. He could take off the arms of Hanover. They were no longer required because Victoria wasn't allowed to become a monarch, a Hanoverian monarch, uh, because women weren't allowed to, to, uh, to be monarchs uh, of the Hanoverians. Uh, so he took the opportunity to redesign the shield, and he also added laurel branches, uh, a symbol of peace and stability. Uh, which reflected the optimism and hope of the country at the start of the Victorian era. And underneath that, he also put a nice little touch. He put a rose, a thistle, and a, and a shamrock together on a, on a single branch to symbolize the unity of the kingdom. And that was pretty much the state of play for, for the next 20, 30 years. Um, in that time, uh, in a period of just six years, the Royal Mint lost its three most talented engravers in very quick succession. Uh, Merlin died in 1850, William Wyon died in 1851, and Benedetta Pastucci died in 1855. So we fast forward to 20 years. In 1871, the Mint had a new deputy master. His name was Charles Fremantle, and Fremantle was chosen by Prime Minister Disraeli to make the Mint more efficient. He introduced more machinery, he employed people committed to accuracy and craftsmanship, and he wanted also to improve the aesthetic appeal of coins. And after an absence of 46 years, he felt it was time for St. George to make a comeback. So, so St. George returned. So you actually had a lovely pairing there. You've got Pastrucci, St. George and the Dragon with obviously William Wyan's classic young head design, uh, which is really, really nice. Um, so then in, in 1887, uh, for, to celebrate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, uh, Fremantle wanted a new portrait on silver and gold coins. An artist called Joseph Edgar Bowen uh, was commissioned to produce it. He was an award-winning sculptor and medal maker. And he depicted her, as you can see, clothed in a heavy silk dress, wearing a small diamond crown over the mourning veil that she'd worn since Prince Albert's death 26 years earlier. And the public absolutely hated it. Uh, they hated the realism. They hated the fact that she was very much an old woman, that she'd been painted with wrinkles, she'd been sculpted with wrinkles. They felt that the crown looked ridiculous, perched precariously on top of her head. They said it lacked regal bearing. And as a result, the design only lasted for six years. Um, somebody also in that time took the decision to make a very small addition to Pastrucci's St. George design. And you might be forgiven for having missed it, um, but you might notice it has just very subtly changed, and the answer is there. Uh, for no, nobody knows why, but they added the streamer uh, to, to the hair, uh, to, to, to his plumage uh, on his helmet. Um, and that streamer was to remain attached to St. George's helmet until 2009, so, uh, so which, is, which is quite astonishing. Um, so the next time, after six years, they decided they wanted a new portrait for Queen Victoria. Uh, they, she herself picked this one out of a, a group of six that she was allowed to choose from, uh, and she picked this design by Sir Thomas Brock, uh, of her wearing a lace mourning veil with pearl drop earrings, a necklace and a tiara. And Brock's portrait of the 74-year-old monarch was praised for giving Queen Victoria a regal, stately and dignified bearing. And you can also see there the inscription uh, 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 that surrounded her. Uh, they added the words INDIMP, which is basically uh, in its Latin, it's uh, India Imperatrix, translated as Empress of India. And uh, control of British India had been transferred to the crown from the East India Company. And the Queen accepted the title Empress of India after Disraeli suggested that it would tie the monarchy and the empire closer together. Uh, so that was Queen Victoria's reign. Uh, when her son Edward became king in 1901, he was 59 years old. He was the longest heir apparent. And he chose to reign under the name Edward rather than his birth name Albert, because he didn't want to devalue the character and reputation of his father. And contrary to expectations, the man who had been a playboy prince uh, was hailed as a peacemaker king for strengthening friendships between countries. 
Uh, he helped to negotiate the Entente Cordiale with France and cultivated a very good public image. And the portrait that you can see there was designed by the chief engraver, William uh, de Sauls, uh, George William de Sauls, uh, and it was very widely acclaimed. And tragically, de Sauls died the following year after a short illness at the age of 41. Um, as the need for a reliable and trusted gold international trading coin increased around the world, production of the sovereign increased dramatically to accommodate this demand. And the coin's Latin inscription was very subtly changed too in response to this rapidly escalating British Empire. Uh, instead of being king of the Britons, the new coin declared that Edward VII was king of all Britons, which was a sort of an important sort of distinction. So there was no chief engraver around. They didn't replace uh, de Sauls when he died very tragically young. And when the, Edward died in 1910, the Mint didn't actually have a chief engraver to actually design the new portrait of George V. So uh, they had to hold a design competition, and it was actually won by an Australian by the name of Edgar Bertram McKennell. And so it's his design, his iconic bearded portrait, that, uh, that actually appears on the sovereign. And this was to be the very last sovereign struck for circulation. The government needed gold, and they needed it quickly to pay for the enormous cost of fighting World War I. And so the public were asked to take their sovereigns to the bank and exchange them for paper treasury notes of the same value. And within a couple of years, sovereigns were very rarely seen in circulation. The people who hoarded the gold coins were seen as being unhelpful and unpatriotic to the war effort. Now, it's easy to see why people were reluctant to exchange their precious gold coins for pieces of printed paper. Uh, unlike today, a coin's value was tied up in its intrinsic metal cost, which meant it was the metal that gave the coins its value. And there was also a fear that if the war went badly for Britain, paper banknotes could become worthless, whereas gold, whereas gold of course, would always have a value. Uh, of course, this is the reason why uh, people would hoard their coins as sovereigns instead of wanting to exchange them for paper money. A lot of coins just simply disappeared. They didn't go back to the bank. In 2017, more than 900 sovereigns, all dated between 1847 and 1915, were found hidden under the keyboard of an old piano donated to a community college in Shropshire. Its previous owners had absolutely no idea they were there. Uh, and so if you if you ever do encounter sovereigns like this sort of pre-1915, uh, very often they, they, they may well have been put away and buried until after the war uh, by people because it was very unfashionable to own them at that time. But obviously the owners had no wish to necessarily transfer them for, for paper banknotes. Sovereigns were produced in Britain until the end of 1917, and they were shipped to the USA to pay for supplies and weapons. Uh, they were kept in Fort Knox until 1934, when the United States made it illegal to own foreign coins, and then the Treasury melted down their stock of sovereigns and converted them into gold bars. So when George V became king in 1910, he reigned over an empire that encompassed a quarter of the world's population. The sovereign had become, in the words of British economic historian Sir John Clapham, the chief coin of the world. And when Britain stopped producing the sovereign as a circulating coin, the overseas branches of the Royal Mint spread throughout the empire continued to strike it. Not since the fall of the Roman Empire had the same coin been struck on so many continents and accepted in ports and markets across the globe. Now between them, the branch mints at, at Melbourne, Perth and Sydney in Australia, in Bombay in India, in Pretoria in South Africa and Ottawa in Canada, actually struck 440 million sovereigns until production ceased in 1932. And that basically ensured that the popular gold coin continued to be a trusted international trading coin for many, many years after it had stopped being used in Britain. Now, you can't keep a good gold coin down, and the sovereign would very shortly reinvent itself, both as a bullion coin for investors and as a beautifully crafted commemorative coin for collectors. Um, Edward VIII's portrait um, was by, Sir Th by Thomas Humphrey Paget. Uh, there he is when, when, when uh, George V died in, in 1936. His eldest son, obviously Edward VIII, became king. Um, 
he refused right from the, the offset to face to the right. There was a convention amongst coins going right back to Charles II, where um, each successive monarch faced in the opposite direction. And you can sort of see them happening there on the screen. Uh, but Edward refused to do that. He, he was, he'd been told that his, uh, his left side was his best side, and so he didn't want to be seen facing right. Um, so the, the Royal Mint had to acquiesce and they, they started to produce his, his portrait and they began striking test samples at, right up until he made the shock decision to abdicate in December 1936. Now a few test pieces had been made uh, in preparation and one of them was actually uh, sold by the Royal Mint for a million pounds in 2020. Now technically this wasn't actually a coin, it was a test piece because in order for a coin to actually be a coin, it needs a royal proclamation, it needs to be issued. And obviously these, these particular coins weren't issued because uh, Edward had abdicated before they became legal tender. So as a result, um, the Royal Mint had to go back to the drawing board. Uh, the throne passed to Edward's younger brother, Albert, and he took the name George VI to provide a sense of continuity. And another way of providing continuity, they asked Humphrey Paget if he would stay on and design the portrait of the new king. So Humphrey Paget did that, and you can see the two are quite similar when you sort of put them side by side. Um, George became the second man called Albert to change his name after becoming a king in the 20th century. Um, and Paget was asked, obviously, to do the new coin, coin portrait. They only had a few weeks to do it before the coins had to be issued. So it was a majorly rushed job. But incredibly, despite that, it is often widely considered one of the finest coin portraits that has a, a classical elegance all of its own. And uh, only 5,501 gold sovereigns were actually struck in 1937. And they were actually struck to include in a four coin set. They weren't actually sold individually. And that, and that particular, the sovereign was never struck again during the reign of George VI, making this the rarest sovereign of them all. So again, if you have a George VI sovereign in your collection, hang on to it because it's, uh, it, it's very rare. Now, the uncertainty, um, certainly um, the economic climate uh, of the post-war years meant that the coin exchanged hands for far more than its bullion value, which inevitably let it vulnerable to counterfeiting on an international scale. And as a result, sovereign production resumed in 1957 for the bullion market. It was actually the first time in 20 years that a sovereign had been produced. And here we see the sovereigns of Queen Elizabeth II. The first portrait you can see there, the, the young head portrait on the top left, was by 71-year-old Mary Gillock. And she was inspired by the young head portrait of Queen Victoria. So she has a laurel and she's got a ribbon in her hair. It's the longest serving royal portrait of all time, as it's still being struck today on the four silver Maundy coins that are produced every year for the Royal Maundy service. Um, so the Gillick portrait is actually the longest serving royal portrait of all time. The second portrait uh, in the top middle there was by Arnold Machen, and uh, that was introduced for the new decimal coins from 1968. And Machen de depicted her with a pearl tiara instead of a laurel wreath or a crown. And a modified version appears on postage stamps as well, appeared from 1967. And since then, because it's still being used on postage stamps today, um, the 320 billion stamps, it's believed to be the most reproduced work of art in history. Um, there was a new production facility, of course, in South Wales, in Antricent, to meet the demand for the new decimal coins. And the very last coin struck at Tower Hill in 1975 was a gold sovereign. And it bore a 1974 date because they weren't actually making them in 75, but it's, uh, it was a gold sovereign. The third portrait, top right there, is by Raphael McClough. And in that, the Queen is wearing the diamond diadem that was made in 1820 for the coronation of George IV. Now, some people complained that the 58-year-old monarch looked flatteringly young, but McClough said that his intention was to create a symbol that was regal and ageless. And I think he succeeded. The fourth portrait, um, you can see there the bottom, the bottom left hand was by Ian Rank Broadley, and he depicted her age, the critics said at the time, with blunt realism in almost harsh detail. But uh, Rank Broadley explained that there was no need to flatter her. He said she's a 70-year-old woman with poise and bearing. 
and she's depicted wearing the same pearl tiara as her second portrait. And the royal family must have liked it because um, he, uh, Rank Baudley went on to, to create coins for the Queen Mother and also a conjoined portrait of the Queen with Prince Philip. And he's also been commissioned by William and Harry to create a statue of their late mother Diana, which is going to be unveiled later this year. So uh, the, another thing you might want to just mention, you might, you might want to see there is that um, the Queen's head on the fourth portrait there is a lot larger than it appears previously. And there's a reason for that. It was deliberate. Um, at that time, um, the coin sizes were actually coming down in size. The silver coins were being reduced. The cubernickel coins were being reduced in size. Uh, and, and Rank Broadly wanted to make sure that uh, her, her face remained the same size. And so the, her portrait was made larger to compensate. Uh, the fifth portrait at the bottom middle there is by Jody Clark, uh, and it was the first time since 1902 that an employee of the Royal Mint had actually designed a monarch's portrait. And it's the first time a coin design had actually been created digitally in a computer rather than using traditional clay or plaster. She's wearing the diamond diadem from her third portrait, and critics liked it. They praised her enigmatic smile and said that it humanised the monarch in a way that no previous design had done. In 2016, uh, there's one other coin there, as you can see at the bottom right there. The Mint took the unusual step of putting a one-off commemorative portrait by James Butler, MBE, on the Sovereign in proof quality. And this was to celebrate the Queen's 90th birthday. Uh, also, she's also wearing the diamond diadem. Butler said that he wanted to show a likeness of her, an affectionate image, as this was a celebration rather than a circulating coin portrait. So it's a portrait of the Queen, which you'll only see on, on, uh, on commemorative coins. It never actually appeared on a circulating coin in your change. Now, Pastrucci's St. George and the Dragon continue to appear on British commemorative and bullion sovereigns every year. But however, on very special occasions, a new one-off design is introduced for that year specifically. And this happened for the very first time in 1989 to mark the 500th anniversary of the very first sovereign that was struck by Henry VII. And the design was deliberately created to, to echo the look of the original. It was the first time since 1887 that a UK sovereign had been struck without Pastrucci St. George and the Dragon on it. And the sculptor Bernard Sindel became the first artist since Pastrucci to design both sides of the same sovereign. And he depicted, as you can see, a front-facing and enthroned Queen Elizabeth II sitting in the coronation chair in her full regalia with her crown and holding the staffs of office. And the reverse was a modern crowned shield of the royal arms, set in the centre of a double rose, which reflected the look of the Tudor original. And it's also significant because it's the very first time that an inscription actually appeared on the sovereign in English. And you can actually see there, you can make out the word sovereign. It, it's, uh, it, it, it used a, an English inscription instead of a Latin or a French one. Um, there are only 23,000 proof quality sovereigns produced with this 1989 design. So this coin is highly sought after by collectors today. And then moving forward, we can actually see a couple of other designs that have actually some reverse designs that have been created as special one-offs. In 2002, the Mint celebrated the Queen's Golden Jubilee with a new interpretation of Merlin's historic sh heraldic shield that was actually struck for the Queen's great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. And it was designed by Timothy Node, a heraldic artist at the College of Art. And in 2005, three years later, Timothy Node won a design competition to create a bold new interpretation of St. George and the Dragon. And you can see his design always reminds me a little bit of comic book art. It only appeared for the one year. Again, very high demand for it because obviously only, only a few were produced. In 2002, the artist Paul Day became the third artist to design St. George for the Sovereign. It was the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. They wanted to commemorate it. And his dramatic depiction of the most famous fight in numismatic history marked a very radical departure from Pastrucci's neoclassical approach. He went for a medieval knight of Arthurian legend rather than a classical hero. And then, which brings us very nicely back up to date, in 2017, uh, Britain celebrated the 200th anniversary of the modern gold sovereign. And during that time, it had become a trusted symbol of Britain throughout the world with a reputation of excellence, accuracy, stability that is endured long after it ceased to be a circulating coin. 
And rather than commission a new design, the mint restruck the reverse that appeared on the very first sovereign in 1817, which is quite an inspired decision for the proof coin. Vespucci's original version of St. George and the Dragon, surrounded by a garter with the French inscription Oni Swaki Mali Palms, which roughly translates as shame on him uh, who thinks evil of it. Um, it's been struck for only four years, between 1817 and 1820. It had never been struck again, so it was a perfect time to take it down and use it uh, to commemorate the 200th anniversary uh, of, the, of the modern sovereign. And so today, as Britain remains an important and influential global power, the gold sovereign is very much seen as an ambassador for our country. It stands proudly as an enduring testament to our international reputation, our technical excellence, and our very rich cultural identity. So that's a, a whistle-stop tour of the sovereign. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you.